Welcome to AbSciCon 2022. I'm Susan Lozier, President of AGU and the Dean of the College of Sciences at Georgia Tech. I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are here in Atlanta and also um, delighted to welcome all of the participants who are joining us virtually this morning. As an oceanographer for the past several decades, I've always been inspired by the romance and mystery of the sea and motivated by the immensity of what we don't know about this vast expanse on our planet Earth. The truth to tell, I have always felt a little sorry for scientists studying more pedestrian topics. However, when considering your work in astrobiology, I stand in awe. Hard to compete with your mysteries and your romances and the sense of vast possibilities. A thousand years ago, near the end of his life, Adelard of Bath, a natural philosopher who uh, lived during the reign of Henry I, compiled a list of 76 questions for which he did not know the answer. Among those questions was, are the stars animate, and if so, what do they eat? Our human existence has been marked by staring at the night sky in wonder and considering the possibilities. And our existence on this earth has been marked by a keen desire to understand how life began. Last week, astronomers revealed the first photo of the black hole at the center of our galaxy. And this week, you're gathered here to carry on the work of generations of scientists that have probed the question of life in this universe. Absicon is the perfect venue for that work. The first APSICON in 2000 was held at NASA Ames Research Center. AGU, with continued support from the NASA community, has been honored to take on the execution of this small but mighty meeting since 2018. While just over 1,000 researchers gathered at that first APSICON, today more than 800 planetary scientists, biologists, chemists, astronomers, engineers, and even a few ocean scientists have gathered. And for that gathering, you have sessions that reflect many different disciplines in the Earth and space scientist, but mostly they reflect the melding of those disciplines. I'm impressed by this community's compassion for interdisciplinary collaboration, yet even more so by its commitment to inclusivity. As someone who started a science career when it was rare for someone who looked like me to be a scientist, it is a delight to, to see listen to, learn from, and be inspired by everyone out there who looks just like you look, a scientist. While Absicon exemplifies AGU's goal of creating an inclusive scientific culture, we are still a long way from an environment where individuals from all social, economic, and cultural backgrounds are equitably included. I encourage everyone to here to join AGU in its continuing commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Brilliance, creativity, and dedication are surely not the purview of a privileged few. Anyone who knows me know that I, knows that I am passionate about supporting and encouraging our next generation of scientists. As such, I encourage you all to participate in peer-to-peer -peer mentoring through the BrainDate platform or sign up for Mentoring 365 where you can develop one-on-one -on -one professional connections that last throughout the year. That's all for me other than to consider what someone a thousand years from now will wonder when they look up at the night sky. Enjoy the week, enjoy Atlanta, and enjoy each other's company. And now please join me in welcoming Frank Rosenswag, the science chair for Absicon, and luckily for me, my Georgia Tech colleague. Thank you for those beautiful and inspiring remarks. Um, good morning, astrobiologists. Uh, I'm tickled to kick off our first day uh, at AbSciCon by introducing our plenary speaker, uh, Professor Nicole King. I first met Dr. King uh, six years ago when she and her son, Nate, uh, traveled to Montana to participate in an NAI executive uh, council meeting and workshop. That workshop was on major evolutionary transitions in the history of life. Major transitions occur 
when a group of individuals that previously could replicate independently come together to form complex autonomous life forms. For example, genes coming together uh, to form genomes, archaea and eubacteria to form eukaryotes, single cells coming together or staying together to form multicellular organisms. So Dr. King regaled the NAI with her unique uh, insights into a transition that makes it possible for us to be here today in Atlanta, namely the advent of multicellularity in the evolutionary clade that gave rise to animals. Dr. King's interests have lain at the intersection of evolution and development since her undergraduate days at Indiana University. There she worked under the supervision of Tom Kaufman, studying how homeotic genes are regulated in Drosophila. For her dissertation research, Nicole worked with Richard Losick at Harvard, which she helped, she helped to dissect the regulation of sporulation in the bacterium Bacillus subtilis. And thereafter, Dr. King pursued postdoctoral studies with Sean Carroll at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she helped pioneer the use of comparative genomics uh, to eliminate deep branches in the tree of life. Since 2003, Nicole has been a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, where she's established herself as a world leader in the field of evolutionary developmental biology, or EVO-DEVO. She has been the recipient of numerous awards, including a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, a Pew Scholarship, and she is currently a faculty investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Aside from all of these honorifics, I can attest that Dr. King is a, a careful and a thoughtful mentor to her students, an attentive mother to her son, and a good friend to those of us lucky enough to claim that relation. Please join me in welcoming to ABSICOM 2022, Dr. Nicole King, who will treat us to a history of hypotheses on the origin of animals. I'm waiting for my presentation to load, I guess. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, it's a real honor to be here. Uh, when I first started my laboratory at the University of California at Berkeley, um, I was taken into the uh, astrobiology community, something I, I didn't even know about before. And it really helped introduce me to the opportunities that come from interdisciplinary research and has really shaped the way I think about the problem of animal origins. Now, the challenge, you know, I think I, I actually was asking myself, why am I uh, invited to speak here? What do I have to, to share that might be of common interest to this community? And I think one of the big challenges that we face as evolutionary biologists is to use um, inference based on the little about, amount of information that's available to us today to try to infer what happened tens or hundreds of millions of years ago. And that will be the focus of my talk today. But I think a similar challenge faces the astrobiology community in terms of thinking about how life might have evolved elsewhere and where might we find meaningful evidence. So I hope that the story I'm about to tell you today will provide inspiration for thinking about those types of challenges. I want to start by just reveling in the beauty of animal morphology. And this, I, you know, the incredible diversity of animal form that we see today. And when I first started to learn about this, pardon me, <clears throat> um, what excited me and surprised me was to learn that all animals actually evolve, evolve from a single common ancestor. And so if you look at this phylogenetic tree, we can infer that all animals today have a common ancestor, this um, indicated by this purple circle here, and that uh, we can study living animals today to try to reconstruct the biology of that organism. In addition, my particular focus has been on trying to reconstruct the organisms from which animals first evolved. 
And in particular, we're trying to figure out what was the nature of the single-celled organism that spawned the animal lineage? How did that organism undergo the transition to multicellularity? And how did, sorry, mechanisms that allowed cells to have different functions, first of all, how is it that cell differentiation arose in this lineage? So I should back up and say that there's no fossil record for the first animal or for, for the animals from which, or the organisms from which animals evolved. And so for a long time, um, we knew very little. But starting in the 1990s, um, focus began to increase on a group of very special organisms called the coanoflagellates. And these coanoflagellates are interesting and important for understanding animal origins because in fact, they are our sister group. They are our closest living relatives. And this phylogenetic tree then shows the diversity of animals, all with a single common ancestor that we call the ur metazoan. And all coanoflagellates, which are equally diverse to animals, which share their own common ancestor. And if we can compare the coanoflagellates to animals, we can reconstruct the biology of that ancient ancestor of these two lineages which I'll call the ur coanozoan okay? So I've tried to keep terms to a uh, minimum, but, uh, but I'm gonna use the phrase coanozoa to describe the group that includes coanoflagellates and animals, and the ur coanozoan to denote their ancestor. Now, what is a coanoflagellate? Maybe you haven't seen or heard of one before. It's a single-celled eukaryote. Um, it has a cell body that you can see here, and a collar of these, um, what are called microvilli. These are long protrusions. And in the center of this collar is a long flagellum. And this has been described by the author Ed Young as sperm with a skirt. And so you can actually imagine it swimming around with its flagellum, but it has this skirt surrounding it, the collar. Now the way this cell works is that the, the flagellum beats back and forth inside that collar. And this creates water currents that pull material out from the water column up against the collar. And that's actually what the coanoflagellate eats. So the coanoflagellate is actually a specialized feeding cell that swims around collecting bacteria against the collar. And so you can see for size example, here's a bacterium next to its coanoflagellate that is about to eat it. We can zoom in on this collar complex a little bit more carefully. So these images um, on the right were taken from live cells. And on the right, you're gonna see, um, we can turn this structure so that you can actually peer into uh, the collar itself. So this is a fascinating structure um, that really is diagnostic for coanoflagellates. If you go out into uh, a body of water, the ocean, a pond, a lake, and you collect water and you see something with this structure, it's a coanoflagellate with one exception. And that is that the only other organisms out there that have a collar complex are the animals. And so here's one example. We're looking into a sponge um, and you can see that they have cells that are nearly identical with this long uh, collar and then protruding out from the collar of the flagellum. Here are 3D reconstructions on the left of a colonial coanoflagellate to show you the collar complex on each of these cells. These are cells from a, a sponge, what's called coanocyte chamber, in which you can see these uh, collar cells now all clustered together. And it turns out that even all of you have cells that have a collar complex. These are cells that line your, um, your bronchus, your branchiae, and you can see that they all have this collar complex as well. And in fact, if we look across um, eukaryotic diversity, the animals, the coanoflagellates, and many different diverse outgroups, what we see is that all coanoflagellates and nearly all animals have the collar complex, but we never see them in non-coanozoans. And so from this, we infer that the collar complex was actually present in the last common ancestor, the ur-coanozoan, and probably evolved along this stem lineage. So for this reason, the community that's focused on studying animal origins has largely coalesced around um, the hypothesis that the progenitor of animals was a collared flagellate. We know that there must have been a collar complex 
and the last common ancestor of coanoflagellates and animals. And so we infer that that ancestor was a flagellate with a collar that then evolved simple multicellularity, and that the type of cell differentiation we see in modern animals must have evolved later. So that's the working hypothesis that, um, that has really dominated the field until recently. But um, OK, I got ahead of myself. In addition, um, we can reconstruct the biology of the first animal, the or metazoan, um, by comparing the biology of diverse animals. And what we think is that the last common ancestor of animals was a simple multicellular organism with what's, what we call an epithelium. These are cells that stick tightly together and, um, and produce a cell layer that's impermeable to the outside environment. Um, and that, that that simple epithelium contained these collar cells or cells with a collar complex, and it ate bacteria. But most importantly, we also infer that it had simple cell differentiation, including the differentiation between these um, columnar epithelial cells and another cell type that I'm going to talk about, which are amoeboid cells or crawling cells. OK, crawling cells are central to animal biology. In fact, all of you are here um, because of an important group of crawling cells, which are in your immune system. And so this is one example right here. And, um, and crawling cells actually exist throughout uh, animal diversity. And this picture down here is of crawling cells that are found in sponges. Now, crawling cells are also found throughout uh, eukaryotic diversity. This single-celled well, amoeba crawls around. There's not supposed to be any volume on that, sorry. Um, there we go. Um, so, so crawling cells are found across eukaryotic diversity. This is uh, an example of an amoeba cell. This is actually a relatively close animal or relative of the Coanozoa and Ichthyosporian. And even these early branching fungi that you can see here um, are able to crawl. And so it looks like this crawling behavior is widespread, and yet we don't know how it first evolved in animals. OK, hold on. We're having a little bit of a lag here. OK. So to talk about this mystery, I first need to uh, reintroduce some of you to Ernst Haeckel. So Ernst Haeckel is um, actually one of his major contributions to biology has been the invention of a lot of important terminology, including the word phylogeny. So he's the one who first uh, um, started drawing these kinds of trees, showing his inferred uh, what he inferred to be the relationship between different groups of organisms. So on the left here, we have his depiction of a phylogeny. But one of the hypotheses for which he's best known is this idea that ontogeny or development recapitulates phylogeny. And so the idea here is that as an organism, particularly an animal, goes through development, it essentially reflects evolutionary um, the, the biology of the ancestors from which it evolved. And this has been, this hypothesis has been highly controversial and it's not the main focus of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, but I wanted you to have this sense that when he looked at developmental processes, what he th saw was evolution unfolding. And so Heckel actually hypothesized that the first animal was not a flagellate, but instead an amoeba. And so, the reason that he did this was that when he looked at the biology of sponges, which he was one of the first to propose that sponges were actually animals, um, he recognized that some sponges or many sponges actually had an amoeboid zygote. So not a flagellate, but an amoeba. And so based on that, he actually proposed that there might have been an amoeboid ancestry for animals. And you can see further stages in his um, hypotheses about the intersection between development and evolution, because as animals evolve, they form these simple balls of cells called a morula, um, followed by this blastula stage, a hollow ball of cells, but now with flagella, and then this gastrulation stage. And so based on this, Heckel, Heckel really held strongly to this idea that the first animal was amoeboid. Of course, he didn't have access to the type of data that I just showed you about the universality of the collar complex. Now, a deep rival at the time, they actually hated each other, <laughs> um, uh, was William Savile Kent. And Savile Kent um, 
actually, first of all, did not agree with the idea that sponges were animals, but in addition, felt that Heckel's idea about um, amoeba, an amoeba being the ancestral state for animals was incorrect. And part of his argument was his discovery of this organism that he named after Heckel as sort of a, a dig, um, which he called Proterospongia hecklei. And this was an interesting organism because it had these collar cells on the periphery, but it had amoeboid cells in the middle. Interestingly enough, nobody has ever seen this organism again. And there's been quite a bit of uh, speculation that Savile Kent, who, who had many moral failings, might have just made it up. Um, and I'll leave you to decide what you think based on what I'm about to show you. So what can we learn from coanoflagellates about this mystery? Were crawling cells in the first animals or, um, or, or did they evolve later within the animal lineage? Now, coanoflagellates are actually named for the flagellum. They are iconic flagellates. They have only been observed in a flagellated state. Every single coanoflagellate that's been identified has a flagellum. And I'm showing you some of these diverse coanoflagellates here. Nonetheless, um, this very brave postdoc, Thibaut Brunet, who's in the middle of this picture here, these other two characters will come in later, um, came to my lab, focused on this question of how cell contractility, which is the, the cellular process that has to happen for cells to crawl, um, how that might have first evolved. And he wanted to look for this, to address this question in coanoflagellates, which I thought was foolhardy since they are only flagellates and never crawl. Um, but I was wrong. And, uh, and, and this was proven to me when Thibaut came rushing to my office to show me that in fact coanoflagellates could convert into an amoeboid cell. And so here what you see on the left are two coanoflagellate cells that have been converted into this amoeboid state. And on the right are cells, are the same cells in which a particular protein has been labeled in red. Oops. So hopefully you can see now that rather than swimming around beating their flagellum, these are now moving around on the substrate by sending out these blebs and kind of crawling across surfaces. Now the way this happens, the way he was able to induce this switch is through a process of cell confinement. And so what you can see is how this works. So on the left, the coanoflagellates are allowed to swim around freely in the water column. But on the right, um, he was able to apply, uh, apply confinement through this structure that, with it has these little tiny microspacers that he just inverted right down onto the coanoflagellates. And what you can see is that that had it produced a defined space in which the coanoflagellates would become squeezed. So this is a data heavy slide, but the, the point I wanna make is that this um, conversion from being a flagellate to a single cell can be tightly regulated by the level of confinement. And so on the left, you can see examples of cells that have been in introduced to um, greater and greater confinement. In this graph, what you're seeing is the fraction of the cells with these protrusions that typify crawling cells. And hopefully you can see that there's this reproducible um, production of cells with, with dynamic protrusions as we increase the confinement or decrease the available space. And then on the bottom is meant to show you, these are stills from movies that show you that um, the cells can be converted from being flagellates to amoeboids and then back again. It's not a permanent transition. So I thought that was super cool. Um, I had never seen a coanoflagellate be an, a crawling cell before, but I was highly skeptical because of the way in which the transition was induced. It seemed very artificial, and it was hard for me to imagine when a coanoflagellate might ever encounter such confinement. But here again, I was wrong. And that is because coanoflagellates, sequences from coanoflagellates have actually been detected in silts that have um, the same amount of space between grains that we see in our experiments that induce uh, amoeboid, the conversion to an amoeboid state. And so actually, we know that coanoflagellates exist in highly confined environments, but they've never been studied in that context before because it wasn't recognized that they lived there. So why are they converting to this amoeboid state under confinement? 
And so what you're seeing here on the left is one of these micropillars that's conf confining the coanoflagellates, and the cells that are outside the circle are actually free to swim. And what you can see if you focus on individuals that are near the edge of this pillar, um, they actually send out protrusions and are able to um, escape from confinement. So hopefully this movie will play, yes. And so you can focus on individual cells that are near the um, periphery, and you can see that they can actually escape. And I'll show you this in a zoom in in a moment. Okay, so we're gonna zoom in. Um, now we're just looking at one cell that's near the edge of one of these pillars. Here it is. It, here it is in fluorescent form. And the point here is that we can actually um, segment these so that we can quantify this behavior. And so I'm gonna start the movie and you're gonna see that the, the cell actually crawls out from the confinement and then it can convert back into a flagellated state. Okay, so is this something special to the one coanoflagellate we've been studying or is it widespread? And in fact, this amoeboid behavior seems to exist in every coanoflagellate that Thibault has looked at. So this is a, a fundamental, highly conserved behavior of these cells, but one that had not previously been observed because people hadn't looked under the right conditions. And this is actually very interesting because it parallels a cell biology that we see in animals called the epithelial mesenchymal transition in which the cell types that have um, collar complexes, shown here on the left, the epithelia, can convert into crawling type cells or contractile cells here on the right. And they do this in part in response to confinement and compression. And so what we see now is that, um, and I'm bringing together a lot of evidence, not just from what I just told you, but from the field in general, is that coanoflagellates are capable of converting from a flagellate to an amoeboid cell, and even to an intermediate cell called an amoeba flagellate. I told you previously that sponges can exist both as um, these amoeboid cells called archaeocytes, but also as um, collar cells, coanocytes. And vertebrates also undergo these types of transitions. And so what this suggests is that animal amoeboid cells that we see the hard, hard programmed into the developmental program might actually evolve from a phenotype that was regulated by the environment previously. And so that's what this shows here. Coanoflagellates and animals are sister group. We think that they evolved from an organism that was capable of alternating between an amoeboid and a flagellated cell type so that there was this plasticity. And that within the animals, the reason that we're able to get this um, well-programmed cell differentiation is that that switch between the amoeboid cell and the flagellated cell um, became hardwired into the developmental program. Okay, so that was our first hint that the prevailing idea about animal origins and the nature of the cells from which animals might have evolved was not wrong, but incomplete. It showed us that these simple, seemingly simple cells were able to take on many different cellular behaviors in response to changes in the environment. And it suggested that um, much of the, the hardware for making different cell types might have predated animal origins um, and simply become, become uh, more strictly hardwired in animals. So I'm gonna tell you about a, a similar unexpected finding that came out of field work that really has given us more insight into the ancestral biology of animals. And this again was work uh, that included Thibaut Brunet, who now has his own lab at the uh, Pasteur Institute in Paris, and two graduate students at the time, Tess Linden and Ben Larson. And we joke that this picture actually depicts the way they were uh, as, as researchers, Ben diving in foolhardily. This is a hypersaline lake. Tess um, documenting everything very carefully and analyzing it. And then Thibault uh, is the, uh, you know, <laughs> supervising and making sure everything is done properly. So he was ready to be a PI at that point. Um, okay, so when we went to Curacao to do field work, um, it was as part of a, a group that was looking at microbial ecology, in particular around coral reefs. Um, but we were particularly interested in understanding what was the diversity of coanoflagellates on this island. 
And I, I'm not a field biologist. I'm learning to be a field biologist. And I wasn't sure what we could do that would be useful. But I thought, you know, just as a, to set a low bar, um, we would start by simply describing coanoflagellate diversity. So we went all over the island uh, collecting in lots of different places and then bringing them back to the, bringing the water samples back to the marine station to look at what we found and see if there was anything interesting. Um, and so we did this for about a week uh, and we found, you know, pretty run of the mill coanoflagellates, nothing exciting until we sampled from what, um, what I've learned is called a splash pool. So this is actually a very harsh environment. This is on the windward side of this island of Curacao. Um, in the background, you might be able to see the uh, uh, windmills. It's very warm. It's in the, the mid to upper 80s, um, warm to a Californian, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, and there are these little pools that are in fact not tide pools. They're not fed by the tide, but they're fed by spray or splash coming off of these waves crashing. And so these pools vary quite a bit. They're, they're sort of an extreme environment because they get very warm. Um, they evaporate and become hypersaline. And there's a lot of interesting biology uh, in these pools. And so when Thibault and uh, Tess and Ben sampled from this pool and brought it back, they found something shocking that completely changed the nature of our sampling on this island. This is what they found. This is a colonial coanoflagellate that forms a sheet. And, um, and what it's actually that sheet is kind of folded up into a cup and you are seeing the lip of the cup right now. You'll also see these predatory flagellates swimming around and you don't need to worry about those. Just focus on this sheet. And this is what they saw. This, this video actually came from the Marine Station on the day that they discovered it. Wow. So these are these little flagellate cells, but they've formed a multicellular structure that's able to do coordinated morphogenetic folding. This was a complete shock to us. Um, and it's not something that had been reported before. Really amazing. How are they doing it, those little cells? So we decided to try to study it in detail. And we discussed, first our question was, what causes this inversion to happen? And it turns out that a lot of things can cause it. So one example is uh, mechanical signals. Um, and this is a bit brutal, but if we stab it, <laughs> it inverts. And we can quantify this. Um, on the right, you can see that along the y-axis, we're measuring the percentage of cells that have their flagella out versus in. And if the cells are kept in a static environment without any sort of turbulence, um, they remain with their flagella in, which is the, the image on the left. And if we shake them, which creates a lot of turbulence and mechanical uh, signals, then they uh, entirely invert and put their flagella in the co collar complex on the outside. But what really shocked us was that light to dark transitions can also induce this. So on the left here, you're seeing um, a low magnification image of a, a culture. And each of these shiny blobs is one of those colonies with hundreds and hundreds of cells. And so what you'll see here is that as we uh, turn the lights off, suddenly the vast majority of these colonies invert, ball up, and start swimming around. And in fact, this inversion really is switching the coanoflagellates from um, a state in which they're sedentary, but actually feeding, eating lots of bacteria, to one in which they're swimming around, and it's perhaps an escape mechanism. And again, we can quantify this. And so you can see here, again, we're measuring, in this case, the normalized sheet area. And before we turn the lights off, this remains at about one. And when we turn the lights off, they invert, and that leads to the sheet area um, becoming much smaller. And that, so that's our proxy for inversion. So the first question we had was, they don't have an eye, they don't have any pigment, how are they detecting uh, light or darkness? And we're not gonna go into the evidence, but just tell you that we were very lucky um, in, in that we were able to quickly identify the protein through which uh, photoreception occurs. And so this is a protein that has two parts. 
One part is shown here. It's uh, related to rhodopsins that allow both bacteria and, uh, and animals to detect light. And the second part of the protein is an enzyme called a phosphodiesterase. The name isn't um, important. What's important, it has this activity that it switches one molecule, a cyclic GMP, into a different type of molecule, a five prime GMP. So simply by shining light on the coanoflagellate, you can drive this conversion from cyclic GMP to five prime GMP, but if you turn the lights off, you accumulate an entirely different molecule, cyclic GMP, and this alone can change the behavior of the cells. Okay, so that's interesting. We know how it's regulated, but how does that actually happen at the structural level? And it turns out that that is driven by a change in the angle of the collar that we've been talking about. So in the flagella end state, all of the collars are straight and, and parallel. And so because they're so uh, close together, it changes the angle of the uh, cells relative to each other. When they switch into the flagella out situation, which I show you on the bottom, the collar opens up and it pushes the neighbors around. And so now you get this inversion into a different curvature. And this is actually regulated by a group of proteins that sit at the bottom of the collar, um, shown in this ring. And I'm gonna talk about it in a moment. These are called, this is the actomyosin complex, okay? So when this ring is wide, then you have the small collar angle, but when the ring of proteins is, um, contracts, then the collar opens up and that changes the entire behavior of the whole uh, layer of cells. Okay, so what is this mysterious protein complex? I mentioned it's called actomyosin, and here we've stained it. We've stained one component, myosin in green, and the other component, actin. Um, here it's showing in magenta. I'm not sure what you guys are seeing. So this is a, a large colony that's been stained for these two proteins, but if we zoom in, I hope you can see that the myosin forms these little green rings and the actin comes in and touches the rings. And it's the connection between those two types of proteins that allows them to um, uh, contract and change the angle of the collar. And so here we can zoom in on it a little bit. Um, and you can see in a relaxed apical ring, this, uh, um, you have the small collar angle so here, these um, molecules are pushing out, the proteins are pushing out, and that's drawing the collar in. When we turn the lights off, now the proteins contract in on each other, and that opens up the collar ring, sorry, which you can see here. Now, how do we know that this is what's actually going on? It turns out that there are a lot of uh, drugs that molecular biologists have developed to disrupt the functions of these proteins. And you don't need to know what these drugs are um, uh, named, but here they are for the aficionados. The main point is if we treat with any drug that disrupts either actin or myosin, what we see here is that now the cells are not responsive to light. They can't do the contraction um, when the lights are turned off the way they could if they weren't, in the, weren't exposed to these drugs. And so that tells us that these proteins are very important for this inversion process. Okay, so um, what I've told you then is that there are two states for this coenoflagellate, which we've named C-flexa. One is with the flagella in. This occurs when the, this ring of proteins is relaxed and opened up. Um, and if we turn off the lights, that ring of proteins contracts, and when it does that, it leads to this collar opening, which I'm showing you here. Why is this so interesting to us? Well, first of all, it's just cool biology, and it's neat to see um, single-celled eukaryotes doing this kind of complicated morphogenetic behavior. Um, um, but what is additionally interesting is that this connection between this myosin ring and morphology here actually parallels something that happens in animals, in which animals start early in development to form this hollow sphere of cells that are tightly connected to each other, like the cells are in the coanoflagellate. 
And they have the same type of proteins, actomycin, and when those contract along one surface, it causes the um, ball of cells to fold in, and that is the beginning of forming new types of tissues and new cell types. So this uh, molecular connection seems to be highly conserved. So where does that leave us? Well, I told you um, in the first part of my talk that coanoflagellates, which have always been thought of as flagellates, are capable of forming amoeboid cells. And it turns out that they do it through mechanisms that are very similar to those used in animals. And now I've told you that a different species of coanoflagellate can undergo tissue morphogenesis, again, using very similar types of molecules to those found in animals. So with these types of observations in living single-celled relatives of animals, we're starting to get a much richer view of what uh, of their own biology and the biology of the last common ancestor of animals. And so what I want to leave you with is this rather complex view of the progenitor of animals um, that shows that we now think that, um, that an ancestral flagellate was actually capable of responding to different environmental cues to either display simple multicellularity, attach to substrates, convert into amoeboid state, um, form a, uh, an environmentally hardy cyst, and even convert from an asexual to a sexual stage with dimorphic gametes. And so what we see is that much of the cell biology that typifies animals um, actually probably predates animal bio or animal origins and was controlled by environmental cues and uh, was typified by lots of plasticity and the ability to change between different cell types. And so with that, I'm gonna thank my wonderful laboratory, um, our funding, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. I guess I can pick this off. Well, thank you, Nicole, for a, a marvelous talk. I, I, I usually do not use the word awesome, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm really impressed by, number one, the, the audacity, you know, of one of your postdocs to, to, to do that experiment. And secondly, uh, the, the wonder of new insights from discovering a new type of organism. I, I, that really took my breath away when yeah. I saw that. Yeah. Uh, that. That's amazing. Yeah, me too. I'm sure there are a lot of questions, and I don't want to hog the, uh, uh, the question scene. So uh, this gentleman over there, could you identify yourself and pose your question, please? Sure. Hi, I'm Mike Long from the Carnegie Institution for Science. Hi, that was Mike. a Fabulous talk. I learned so much. Oh, good. <laughs> um, so I was wondering, given what we know now about the environmental factors that contributed to the emergence of animal life here on Earth, if you had any speculations about whether or not this same kind of major transition would occur on an icy subsurface ocean world like Europa or Enceladus? Interesting. Um, to me, the when I think about life on other planets, it's difficult for me to anticipate what it would look like or whether it will closely mimic what we have on Earth. But what I do think is a reasonable inference is that we've underappreciated the diversity of physiological states of, uh, of microbes on this planet. Um, and that, that plasticity and ability to respond dynamically to different environmental states, I think is probably has evolved under selection is, been important for their survival. And so I would anticipate that you would see similar types of flexibility and plasticity in life evolving elsewhere. Um, but whether it would look like exactly like the types of transitions I've described is I, I have no idea. <laughs> cool, thank you. Thank you. Hello, Hi. I'm uh, <laughs> Tony Bernetti here yeah. from uh, Georgia Tech. Yeah. and. I was curious, I couldn't help but notice when you poked those uh, things and they invert in response yeah. to it, yeah. the whole thing does not just where you poke it. I wonder if you know if these guys are passing signals to each other and if so, what those signals might be. Right, very good observation. Um, we tried to test that because we, can, we know that we can uh, 
let me back up. <laughs> I suspect that they are mechanically coupled. Okay. So if you poke one and it starts and it pulls its flagella in or pushes them out, that movement by one cell is going to be perceived by its neighboring cells. And I suspect they respond to that, not to a chemical signal. Um, we tried to test that by actually specifically shining light on one part of a colony and not others. And we haven't worked at that out yet, but it's definitely something we're very interested in. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. That was great. Um, I'm Abel Mendez from the University of Puerto Rico at the Recibo. And I am very intrigued because we can probably not look today at uh, a, another origin of life because there's life already mm -hmm. present and that would be a competition there. But can we see that these amoeboid structures are leaving examples today of life trying to stack on genesis for complex life? Or do you think maybe not the same as before, but something that we can say is uh, an, a good example of the second genesis for complex life today? The sec I... A second genesis for the, the complex life oh. today. Oh, so if we were allowed, if we were to come back and look a few hundred million years from now, would we see that coanoflagellates had spawned um, another complex lineage? Is that the question? Or... Yeah, I, I mean, if these are structures, these amoeboid today are examples, living examples today yes. of second genesis of a complex life. Yeah. Not probably the same as happened originally, right. but we can say that we, we should make that a big conclusion. <laughs> yeah. I think we need more evidence before we can go there, but I think it's a really interesting idea. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Pavel Clear, postdoc at NASA Ames. Um, and uh, my question was, um, you had um, some annotations on one of your slides when you were talking about some of the um, transitions between the states where you had labeled um, certain transitions as happening post-transcriptionally versus transcriptionally, and I wondered. I meant to, to remove all that, but okay. yes. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't know how, I was wondering if, the, if you wanted to uh, like discuss that a little bit more. And yeah. so, you know, what are some of the like genetic mechanisms there and how that might be different in animals versus the coanoflagellates? Sure. So, um, yeah, I was trying not to uh, get too much into the genetics, but in animals, development is regulated large, well, largely transcriptionally. So that's where this unfolding of cell differentiation and cell states is ultimately regulated, is at the level of which genes are turned on and off and when. There's also post-translational regulation that occurs. Um, but you know, for, for all intents and purposes, we can start with transcriptional regulation. And that is hardwired. You know, that, I, I'm oversimplifying it, but it's, that is reproducible from generation to generation. In coanoflagellates, these responses are reversible. They don't go in order. There's no program. It's just an on the fly, oh, damn, I'm you know, stuck between this silt. I've got to do something different. And they do it very rapidly at, um, at speeds that are too fast for it to be explained by turning on and off different genes. So we think that it's happening post-translation. Post-translationally, it's happening through the rapid activation of proteins and the modification of proteins as opposed to at the level of transcribing different sets of genes. Does that? Yeah, I guess as a follow-up yeah. question also, do you think that there was a point in that, like a distinct point in the evolutionary history where there was a transition from like post-translational responses to transcriptional responses in like the kind of coenoflagellate to animal um, transition? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that it's clear that cell differentiation in animals does unfold as part of a program and l largely that goes back to transcriptional regulation. In coenoflagellates, to my eye, it's really a matter of how quickly a cell state transition has to happen. So for instance, we can convert them from being haploid to dip, or sorry, from sexual to asexual and back again. And that process can take over two weeks and likely does involve transcriptional changes. But these amoeboid to flagellate state uh, transitions happen on the order of minutes 
that's too fast. It has to be translational. So I don't know that there's going to be a hard and fast. It was post-translational before animal origins. It's transcriptional uh, in animals. I don't think there's going to be that clear divide. I think it's going to be situation specific. But in animals, we do see a predominance of these um, reproducible programs that get recapitulated from generation to generation. And that's very different from what we see in microbial eukaryotes. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk. Thank you. Hi, Lynn Rothschild, NASA Ames. I really don't have a question. Just I wanted to <laughs> congratulate you for a really fabulous talk. Thank and you. Frank for having the insight to have a protozoologist <laughs> first as an old protozoologist myself. <laughs> and really a comment to the younger people in the audience. I'm not going to put an age limit on it. But notice that all this started with observations through a microscope, not with going into the lab and sequencing, and that much of these hypotheses have been around for 150 years. Yeah. And so it is well worth dusting off your microscope, <laughs> looking through it, and in this case, it's the molecular data that confirmed the microscopy. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, Antigona Segura from Mexico City, um, the National University in Mexico. Yes. Um, I'm no biologist, so <laughs> but for what I understand, all these changes uh, from going to uh, to create animals were morphological. So, at what point this became something that were passed from generation to generation? Because I mean, if it's only more morphological then it's behavior, then how do you make one generation after generation and then you make animals? What, yeah. what yeah. happened there? <laughs> I think that is a brilliant question. And something that I didn't get a chance to talk about is the fact that we think that animals and coanoflagellates diverged, you know, we don't really know, 750 million years ago, a billion years ago, we don't know. And we don't have any intervening lineages between the two, they either they've all gone extinct or um, or we haven't detected them. And so what I think is that there were there had to have been early experiments with multicellular, you know, stable, reproducible multicellularity that we just don't have representation for today. So all we have now are animals and animals have this very uh, um, reproducible development from generation to generation. And if and if they didn't, you know, they wouldn't survive, we assume. Um, but we don't have any examples today of ones that uh, are more flexible in that, in that process. So I, I think that brings up a really important point. Hi, uh, my name is Matt Reinhold from Stanford University. And I want to point out that was an amazing talk as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's out of my wheelhouse, so I'm just going to put out my, I want to just get your thoughts on a topic, and that is that for animal life and multicellular animals and plants, we have this long lineage of very complex big things, right? which started at some point kind of quickly in mm -hmm. geologic time, mm -hmm. whereas the chronofragilates, if I said it right, yep, <laughs> um, have basically been doing what you showed for all that time, and over the billions of years, there seems to be this long-term stasis, but animals decided to do something else. I was wanting to get your thoughts in light of your talk right. as to why, what was that? Yeah. So the, the problem of understanding multi, let me just back up and say that there are different kinds of multicellularity. So plants, animals, and fungi are what we call clonal multicellularity. They evolve by, um, stabilizing interactions between sister cells after cell division. So that first cell divides, those cells stay together. And that's the kind of multicellularity that has led to the complexity that we see in animals, plants, and fungi. There's a second kind of multicellularity called aggregation. And in this case, different cells from the same species can come together. And so you may have heard of an organism called Dictyostelium, which is like a Great example of that, the slime mold, where these amoeboid cells are crawling around in the soil, but when they start to starve, they send out signals um, that say, hey, I'm over here, and they, they crawl together, and they produce this multicellular stalk-like structure. Um, and that type of multicellularity is also widespread, but does not become complex. And we can talk another time about why that might be the case. 
Um, so coenoflagellates actually do both. So they can do clonal multicellularity and they can do aggregative multicellularity. And, uh, and I, I suspect that they haven't become more complex because they haven't needed to. You know, for whatever reason, they occupy a niche where whatever they're doing is good enough. And animals evolve multicellularity through, um, I mean, this is a very long philosophical <laughs> discussion to have, but a combination of, uh, you know, contingency, the type of genetic and cellular machinery they inherited, and chance that they found themselves in some environmental niche for which multicellularity made sense. And that could have been because it allowed them to collect different kinds of prey. It might have allowed them to survive uh, desiccation in a different way. There's a lot of, we can speculate until the cows come home, and I don't think there's a good answer, but it's definitely something that people think about. A uh, quick little, uh, quick little side question. Sure. Has someone done a genetic clock to see like when the two groups uh, sp split off? Uh, they have, um, and I would love to get all your thoughts because I just, without a fossil record, I don't trust the calibration. But okay. I'm happy to be disabused of that notion. I think you can do molecular clocks in animals because you have a very nice fossil record, um, but with nothing in coanoflagellates, I just, I just hedge my bets and I say it's in this general area <laughs> of time. Fair enough, thanks. Yeah. We have time for one more question, I believe. Here's another, she was there first. Okay. Oh. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Amy Fung and I'm a student at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And I was wondering that you mentioned that this inversion behavior was observed in the samples that you collected from the splash pools. Yes. And I was wondering if you had any hypotheses as to why it had something to do with like specifically the splash pools and not the other samples collected around the area. And especially since you mentioned that it was a more, uh, it had a higher salinity environment and it was a lot warmer. And I was wondering if that had something to do with like the other uh, kind of like, yeah, just like in general, if that had something to do with it. Yeah, so we don't know. I, I told you don't pay any attention to these predators, but actually if you do pay attention to the predators, uh, one possibility is that it's an escape mechanism and that when they get bumped into by a predator, uh, that that can cause them to invert and swim away. Um, I don't think there's any way to know what the environmental connections are or the ecological connections until we sample more or more different kinds of species. We've, we've sampled this species repeatedly. Um, and so for exactly that reason, we're planning to start sampling all over the Caribbean and going to different environments and seeing if we can get these types of coanoflagellates from different species, but from similar environments. Because correlation is not causation. So, uh, so we just don't really know if there's something special about that environment or if it's just chance. Awesome. Thank you. Thank Good you. question. We have, a, we have a substantial online participation, and in recognition of that, I'm going to stretch it a little bit and pose this question that's been brought to my attention by Ben Pierce, and that is, does light only induce changes to GMP nucleotides? What about other nucleotides? Ah, so... Um, Yes, we've tested, and it really is cyclic GMP to five prime GMP is the the readout. It's not any of the cyclic AMP, um, and uh, and it's not just light. So it turns out mechanical induction, light to dark. Um, we have a paper. I think it's out now on nitric oxide signaling. Hmm. So NO gas can induce this, and and we have others. So we think that there are many inputs, but they all seem to go through cyclic GMP signaling. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, this concludes our session. Uh, I would like to thank Nicole for a really awesome, uh, a really beautiful talk. And um, I've been told to remind everyone that coffee and refreshments are down on the first floor, not directly outside. And so I thank you for your participation and for your interest. Have a great day here at EBSICON, and let's give another round of applause to Nicole. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks.